What's up, Renaissance family? My name is Jordan. I am one of the pastors here on staff. And what a way to start our new year. Now, it is our plan and our hope that we'll be able to regather as soon as possible, hopefully next Sunday, which is January 9th. But in the meantime, between time, I want us to hop into our word for today. I think it's a word that is going to meet us exactly where we are, and it's certainly something that I need personally. So let me pray for us before we get into today's message. Heavenly Father, you know exactly where we are, and I pray that your word would be something that encourages us, challenges us, comforts us, but most importantly, Lord, it meets us exactly where we are. I ask this in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, I learned a lot in all of the schools that I've gone to. A lot of stuff that has been useful and some stuff that has not been very useful. I still have never used the Pythagorean theorem as an adult, but that notwithstanding, uh, one of the things that they don't teach you in school is how do you manage uncertain times? How do you manage uncertainties? Now, one of the things that is probably one of the biggest challenges in life is how do we navigate life's uncertainties? Now, as we are in 2022, uh, most assuredly, uh, we have a number of things that are uncertain ahead of us. My kids, will their schools be open or, or closed? Uh, uncertainty with work, uncertainty in our relationships, my loved one's health and how they're doing. For me personally, decisions that we're making for our church uh, and just in general, being prepared for the disappointment of plans being made and broken and things that we have hoped for that might not pan out. Now, with all of the uncertainties, what this leads to is a real sense sometimes of fatigue. And there's a number of ways that we go about dealing with life's uncertainties. Now, one of them is extremely unhealthy, and it's something that I do quite often, and it's really just worry and anxiety. Now, a lot of times in a sermon, what I'll do is I'll give a definition of a term to make sure that we all know we're on the same page, but I don't think I need to define worry. I don't think I need to define anxiety. Uh, we all know exactly what it is because we do it so, so often. Now, my goal for today is not necessarily how to teach us how to worry, because I, I certainly know that we do that. But what is a way that we can navigate life's uncertainties in a healthy, biblical, God-honoring way? Now, a couple of disclaimers from the outset. Uh, number one, when we talk about worry and anxiety, I, I fear sometimes that the, the reaction is just like this thing of just don't do it. And I think some people here that we should just stuff it down and pretend that things don't exist. Now, one of my favorite quotes that we talked about in our relationship series is that unprocessed emotions don't die, they just get buried alive. Unprocessed emotions, unprocessed fear, unprocessed anxiety, if we just stuff it down and pretend that it's not there, it's not gonna die, it's not gonna go away, it's just gonna be buried alive. So we need a better and more healthy way to navigate it than just pretending that it doesn't exist. Number two, there is a little bit of anxiety that is like a good thing. And anxiety is not a good thing, but our, our bodies have been hardwired to respond to things that are dangerous with anxiety. If you see a kid playing in the middle of the street, of course you would feel anxiety, not because something is wrong with you, but because in many cases it is a call to action. Now the challenge with most of the worry and the anxiety that we deal with is that there is nothing that we can do immediately. There is no immediate call to action to resolve it. So we are left with this brewing uh, sense of anxiety and worry that exists in our hearts for days and weeks and months on end, which is the type of anxiety that we want to avoid. Now, lastly, a last disclaimer that I wanna make is when we talk about worry and anxiety, um, I, I don't also want people, I don't want people to hear me uh, saying that everything about worry and anxiety is all a spiritual problem. Now, personally, I have been diagnosed with generalized anxiety disorder, and I've been seeing a therapist for the last decade, and I will continue to see my therapist uh, in the future regularly, because there is a medical type of anxiety that exists. And if that is something that you're struggling with, that or any other mental health issue, man, I, I don't want you to hear that this is some spiritual recipe to avoid mental health. And I want you to take your mental health very seriously, especially as we are encountering the, the uncertainties ahead of us. So disclaimers aside, there is 
a warning in scripture to not worry. That the knee jerk reaction that we have whenever we encounter life's uncertainties to be filled with anxiety and worry and try to take things into our own hands is a really unhelpful thing that we try that we try to do. So in a lot of ways, what I want to do today is to give us a little bit of a course, something from scripture that is extremely practical on how do we navigate life's uncertainties. What can you do today, next week, as life's uncertainties certainly um, uh, reveal themselves to you as you encounter them in a variety of different ways? So there's a scripture that I want us to, to read for today that's going to ground us for what I want us to do today. It's something that if you've been around Renaissance, you've heard it before. For many of you, it's going to be a reminder, but I think it's going to be a helpful and timely reminder for you to do today. Now, some things that we talk about in Renaissance are spiritual realities that are things that you should believe. Now, this is cer certainly, we're going to touch a little bit of that, but today I really want it to be practical. I want you to actually do the things that we're talking about doing today. Now, here's a, a quick disclaimer also. I don't want you to wait to feel like doing these things. I want you to do them. I want you to schedule them in your calendar tomorrow morning or today even to put aside some time to intentionally go through these practices. These are things that we have to do not to rely or to wait on our feelings to make us want to do these things, but to do them. So this scripture comes to us in Philippians 4, and I'll read verses 6 through 7. Now, this scripture was written by a man named Paul, and Paul wrote about a half of the New Testament. And Paul is actually writing this letter called the Philippians from a jail cell in Philippi. So that's a little bit of context of what Paul is saying. He is not writing this letter from the pinnacle of joy and delight. He is writing this letter in an extremely difficult situation as he is in prison, not sure if he's going to be executed, not sure if he will ever be released. And here's Paul's words to us in Philippians 4 verses 6 through 7. He says, don't worry about anything, but in everything, through prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And if you do that, if you don't worry about anything, and if every, in everything you, through prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, you present your request to God, this is what Paul says is going to happen. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, it's going to guard your hearts and mind in Christ Jesus. Now, really quick about verse seven, what Paul is talking about here is a military term for guard. And again, Paul is writing this letter in prison as uh, in his experience of being someone who was imprisoned. He knows what it means to be guarded. To be guarded means that there is no room for escape, that 24 seven, you are linked to someone else and that's guarding you. And here's what Paul is saying. If we do these things, then the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, is going to guard us. It's going to be close to us. It's going to be right with us the whole way. So there's three things that we see in the scripture that I want us to, to do today. To not Number one, don't worry about anything. Number two, pray about everything. And number three, give thanks in all things. So don't worry about anything. Pray about everything. And number three, give thanks in all things. Now, Paul is pretty clear about the relationship between peace and worrying. In, for, in verses six, he says, do not be anxious about anything or don't, don't worry about anything. Now, the word Paul uses, um, as long as I got my student loans, I got to bust out the Greek every now and then. The word that Paul uses in, in verse six is marin mal, which is the same word that Jesus uses in Matthew six when he tells us not to worry. Now, in Matthew six, Jesus has one of the most famous sermons ever preached, it's called the Sermon on the Mount. And in this sermon, Jesus is talking about a variety of things. And then he gets to the section in Matthew 6 where he talks about worry and anxiety. And Jesus says it straight up and down, don't worry. Here's what he says in verses 25 through 26. He says, therefore, I tell you, don't worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink or about your body, what you will wear. Isn't life more important than food or the body more than clothing? Consider the birds of the sky. They don't sow or reap or gather into barns, yet your heavenly father feeds them. Here's a question that Jesus leaves us rhetorically. Aren't you worth more than they? So the first thing about worry that I want us thinking about from Matthew 6 
and why it's so unhelpful for us to worry and why you and I should stop worrying right now. And I'm preaching to myself is this, worry is unnatural. Human beings are the only creation in all of God's universe that worry about things. There are not bears who are sitting around thinking about something that happened three months ago or what might or what next winter is going to look like. Bears and lions and tigers, <laughs> animals in the, in the natural kingdom live in the, right here in the, in the present, in the moment. And human beings are the only ones, I think it's because of our imagination, that worry. And Jesus reminds us that worry is, it's unnatural. Here's what Paul says, I'm sorry, here's what the writer says in Proverbs 12 and 25 about what this unnatural worry does to us. It says, an anxious heart weighs a man or a woman down. You know that one, where you feel like you're pulled down by your worries. And the word worry actually comes from an old English word, which means to strangle or to choke. That word means that every time we are, we are worried about something, that we invite this unnatural thing in our life, that God has not created us to worry, man is strangling the life out, the spiritual life out of our hearts. Now, number two, the reason that we should never worry, and again, I'm preaching to myself, is that worry is just unhelpful. It doesn't do anything, nothing good at least. Worry cannot make you one inch taller. Worry can't give you a six pack. Worry cannot lengthen your life, but it can shorten your life. Here's what Jesus says again in Luke 12, 25 through 26. It says, who of you by worrying can add a single hour to your life? Since you cannot do this very thing, why do you worry about the rest? Now, this is a bar from Jesus where he's really showing us the unhelpful nature of worry. He says this question, which one of you by worrying can just add an hour to your life? Now, here's the thing about worry. If there's something you can do about whatever situation is giving you anxiety, you should do that. You should change it. But if there's nothing you can do about it, like the situation we find ourselves in so often, Jesus gives us this warning and this reminder that worrying is unhelpful. It can't do anything to change our situation. Nothing for the better, at least. Now, the third thing that I want us to think about in terms of worrying is that it's, it's unnecessary. So number one, it's unnatural. We're the only people, the only creation in all of God's creation that worry. Number two, it's unhelpful. It doesn't add anything good to the situation. And number three, worry is unnecessary. Here's what Jesus says. Why worry, my worry, why your worry is so unnecessary. Matthew 6 and 30, it says, if God cares so wonderfully for flowers that are here today and are gone tomorrow, it's gone tomorrow. Won't he most surely care for you, O oh, you of little faith? Here's what Jesus is saying. Think about the flowers in the field that God cares for. And if God cares, Jesus says he cares wonderfully for them. And if God cares wonderfully for the flowers that are here today and gone tomorrow, he says this word, these words that I want you to take to heart. Won't he most surely care for you, O oh, you of little faith? Now, I think what Jesus is getting to is that the heart of the problem is a problem with our hearts. In our hearts, we don't really believe the gospel. We don't believe that God loves us as a father loves his children. So we worry that we don't think there's anybody to look after us. We stress about ways that we can control our lives, try to manipulate situations so that um, we can rest because we're not believing that God takes care of us, that God cares for us. You know, there's a scripture I've been meditating on this past week, 1 Peter 5, where Peter says, cast all of your cares on him. Here's why. Because he cares for you. God doesn't care about you. God cares for you. And it is this image of a parent caring for a small child. So number one, don't worry. It is unhelpful. It is unnecessary and it's unnatural. So that's the number one thing that Paul says in Philippians 4. Don't worry about anything. Number two, he says, but in everything through prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. So number two, Paul says, number one, don't worry about anything. Number two, he tells us to pray about everything. Now, this is really in, encouraging for me because it gives me something practically to do with my unprocessed feelings of fear, sadness, anxiety, 
that I don't just have to stop worrying, which is the first and necessary step. But number two, I need to do something with what I have going on inside of me. And Paul says, instead of turning that into worry, he says, turn those to God in prayer. So Paul says, don't panic, pray. Stop talking to yourself about everything that's going on. Now, one of the things that is really paralyzing is when we are isolated in our own heads, stewing about something over and over and over and over again. And the freedom to get free from anxiety and worry will not come in staying in our heads isolated, but rather taking these concerns and presenting them to God. So talking to yourself won't do anything helpful, but talking to God will. Now, here's the thing about prayer. Over the years, I have misunderstood prayer greatly, and I have primarily understood prayer as something that will change my situations, which in many cases, it does change the situation. But in every single scenario, even if prayer doesn't change my situation, prayer is intended to change me. So when Paul says to not worry about anything, but in everything to pray, Paul knows this personally, that his prayers might not change where he is. Again, he's writing this letter from prison, but it will change him and it will change you and it will change me. So the second part of the situation uh, and this, uh, this admonition from Paul, how do we approach and navigate life's uncertainties? Verse six, do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. Now it is not your job to figure out how God is gonna do everything in your life. It is not your job, it is not your task. There is not one area in your life that God is not interested in. God is interested in your life and he can handle everything that is going on in your life. Now there's an author named Philip Yancey and he wrote this really beautiful line that I've been meditating on this morning. And he says this, prayer is a declaration of dependence upon God. Now, when we bring our requests to God, we're basically telling ourselves that we are not in control and that we are going to the one who is in control and we are casting our dependence on God. You wanna know one of the greatest sources of anxiety is when you think things, everything is up to you. And in prayer, when we lay down our independence, our feelings of self-importance, our pride that says everything matters, that everything is up to us, in prayer, we lay those down and we take it to God. And it also helps us to reorient our mind and our hearts to reality. There's an old Indonesian proverb that says, even the smallest penny can block out the sun if you hold it close enough to your eye. Even the smallest penny can block out the sun if you hold it close enough to your eye. Now, what is that proverb getting at? That proverb is saying that it is, an, it is quite possible for us to lose the perspective of how big God is based on the size of our problem. And that if we hold our problem close enough to us, if we hold the problem, if we magnify the problem close enough to us, it's big enough to even block out our sun, the sun, which is you know infinitely bigger than a penny. But if we put things back in their proper perspective, if we allow the sun to be the sun, if we allow God to be God, it shows us the reality of the situation in a much better way. And in prayer, when we come into God, this is when we can realign ourselves to our finite nature and God's infinite nature. And it allows us to be freed of this feeling and this burden that everything is up to us. So there are a lot of different ways to pray. Uh, one of the ways that I pray, particularly when I'm feeling anxiety and worry, is something called the ACTS model. The ACTS model is A-C-T-S, and it stands for adoration, confession, thanksgiving, and supplication. Adoration, confession, thanksgiving, and supplication. Now, normally what I do is I will read a passage of scripture, a chapter or two, depending on, uh, depending on how long or short the chapter is, and I will look for something to, to lead me towards prayer. And these four prompts are the things that I'm looking for as I'm reading the scripture. So we can look at Matthew 6 and 30, where Jesus says, if God cares so wonderfully for flowers that are here today and gone tomorrow, won't he most surely care for you, O you of little faith? And from this, 
I look for what are things about God that I can adore. So adoration means worship. And I start thinking about how big and how good God is. Now, adoration is not thanks. It's not gratitude just yet. Adoration is looking for God's character, uh, God's character and God's nature to properly align ourselves with who God is. Now, whenever you read scripture, the most important question you will ever answer is who is God? Now, from the scripture in Matthew 6 and 30, it says, if God cares so wonderfully for flowers that are here today and gone tomorrow, won't he care for you, O you little faith? So who is God in the scripture? God is one who cares for people. And from this, I will spend some time praying prayers of adoration, thanking God and adoring God for being one who, who pays attention to me, who doesn't forget me, who doesn't make me measure up in order to care for me, who doesn't require that I know how to navigate, navigate life, situation, life situations, but tells me to come to him and to lay down all of my anxiety at his feet because he will take care of it. The God who invites me to cast all my cares on him because he cares for me. You know, as a, as a parent, one of the things that has been the most helpful, quite honestly, is seeing my children in times of, of need. And one of my greatest joys, one of my greatest joys is to be able to provide for them emotionally, physically, and, and spiritually. How much more does God desire that in our lives? So the first thing I do is I adore God for being a God who cares for us. And it helps to me, me to realign myself, my problems, my issues with who God is. Number two is confession. Now, confession could be related to the scripture or it could be related to something else. But in this text, it's something that is pretty much very obvious for me in my life right now. And it's that I'm, I'm worrying. I'm not believing that God is going to care for me. So I worry about my kids in their school. I worry about loved ones. I worry about this or that because I believe that it's all up to me. So in confession, I'll confess that God, I am expressing sorrow and contrition for pretending to be you, for pretending to be omniscient, for pretending to be omnipotent and, and all powerful, and I'm not. And God, in confessing that I am not, it's allowing me to put God where he is in my life. The third part is thanksgiving. So number one, adoration. Number two, confession, confessing the ways that we have not lived up to what the scripture is calling us to do. Uh, number three is thanksgiving, which basically now thanksgiving is expressing gratitude to God for how he has operated in your life. And this we're going to get to this in the next point. But Paul says to pray with thanksgiving. And this is a really, really necessary part of our prayer life, that we're not just praying for God to do things but we're also thanking God for what he has done in our life and recounting God's faithfulness to us. And the last one is supplication. And basically that's a deep word that basically means asking God for our needs, praying to God for our needs, specifically enumerating and listing out what we need God to do and trusting and hoping that God will come through for us. Now, this is a time where we are again, uh, declaring our dependence on God. We're acknowledging that we cannot bring these things to pass. And let me be perfectly honest. There are things that I have prayed for for years, and there is no indication that it is going to happen anytime soon. In those times when I'm praying for something that God has not yet done, I remember Luke 18, where Jesus tells a parable about a woman and an unjust judge. And Jesus tells this parable in prayer. He says, so that we would always pray and not give up. One of the mysteries of prayer is that God invites us to pray, even though oftentimes there is no immediate resolution to our prayer requests. Now, in these moments, I tend to believe that what God is doing inside of us is more important than what the prayer request actually is. And that in the waiting and the praying over and over and over again, God is developing an endurance a patience, a connection, a passion inside of us that would not exist otherwise. So I don't know why God doesn't always answer prayer, but I do know that he invites us to pray for things without failing, without giving up. So then I, I pray the adoration, confession, thanksgiving, supplication, and then I concluded with two minutes of silence. So number one, Paul tells us not to worry. Jesus, 
hits us with the illest sermon in Matthew 6 that explains to us that worry is unnatural, it's unhelpful, and it's unnecessary. Number two, uh, to pray about everything. And there's a lot of different ways we can go about prayer. I just went through the Acts model. There's, again, infinite ways that we can pray to God. Number three that Paul tells us to do in the scripture that I want you doing immediately is to give thanks. So there is that one line where Paul says to present your prayer and petition with thanksgiving. Now, Paul is very clear about this. There's another scripture in 1 Thessalonians where Paul says this uh, specifically. He says, rejoice always, pray constantly, give thanks in everything, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Now, Paul is in prison and he's talking about praying with thanksgiving. Why would Paul talk about thankfulness like this? Now, life is confusing sometimes. Life is painful. Life is awkward. Maybe today you feel unsure or are lacking confidence. Maybe you feel like you don't know what to say or to do, or possibly you don't even know what you believe about anything right now. You're just confused or tired or, or, or perplexed, and that's okay. But what Paul is inviting us to do is a practice of gratitude that is very foundational to your faith and how you are experiencing life's moments right now. Now, it is incredibly easy for me to not be grateful for what God is doing because I'm not aware of all of the things to be grateful for. So what I've done this morning as I prepared for this message today was I spent some time writing down the things that I am grateful to God for. And I was surprised at how long of a list that I can go down to thank God for. And there is a direct correlation between practicing gratitude and my experience of worry and anxiety. Because when I'm experiencing worry and anxiety, many times it is because I've forgotten God's faithfulness in my life. So there's a couple of things I wrote down today with respect to just my life and my family and this church. And as I was practicing gratitude, I just remembered God's faithfulness over and over and over and over again. And I felt the guard of God's peace coming in the door. Now, if there is nothing else to be thankful for, I think we should be always thankful for God's grace in our life. And that grace is most evident to us on the cross of Jesus Christ. Now, on the cross of Christ, that is the declaration of God's love, his presence, his empathy, his care, his salvation for us. That there is no length that God will not go to for his children. And as I was thinking about the cross this morning, in light of all of the worries that I have, my kids' school, work, and social relationships, and plans that I had made, I thought to myself this, about the question that Paul asks in Romans 8. If God didn't spare his own son, think about this. If God did not spare his own son by giving us Jesus, won't he also, with Christ, give us everything, grant us everything that we need? And the answer to that is, of course, yes. So this is what I want you to do. And again, I don't want you to wait to feel like doing this. I want you to spend some time and I want you to not worry about anything. Think about how unhelpful your worry is. And I want you to pray about everything. You can read through Matthew 6 and pray through the Acts model on that. And I want us to be intentional about practicing gratitude. Spend five minutes thanking God for his grace and his activity in your life. Let me close this in a prayer right now. Uh, God, our Father, I am so grateful that you care for us and that you invite us to come to you, to lay down our burdens, that you will take them up and that you care for us. Heavenly Father, I confess all the anxiety and worry in my life, oftentimes rooted in my unwillingness to let go of control in my life. Father, I lay down my false sense of control and I acknowledge that you are the one who is in control. And Father, I pray that you would fill me with a reminder of your goodness and your faithfulness to us. Father, I'm so thankful for all of your activity in my life. Don't let me forget that as these waves come crashing in now. Don't let me forget all the ways that you have shown up for us. And Lord, I, I'm so grateful. If for nothing else, you on the cross, don't let that be small in my life right now. Help me to see your faithfulness to us in that primarily. And Father, I pray that you, that you would give us wisdom 
to navigate the life's, the uncertainties that face us. I pray that you would give us endurance. I pray that you would give us joy. I pray that you would be with us. We pray all these things in Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen.